happy to see so many people here today who have an interest in the topic of new data types. Um, in a moment, uh, my colleague, uh, Martin Valvera, he's going to tell you a, a bit about what we mean by new data types. So I'll leave that to him, um, but let me just um, begin by putting forward um, the main purposes of, of this workshop. Uh, one goal of the workshop is simply to inform about the, the stakes around the use of new data types uh, for the sciences, um, especially the social sciences, um, especially the, the reuse of uh, data sets that have been put together for uh, primary research um, and how, how this can be facilitated. A second purpose of the workshop is to stimulate exchange, um, especially from um, an archival perspective within the context of SESTA. And for those of you who are um, not familiar with SESTA, because there are people here from many different, um, uh, different domains and institutions, uh, SESTA is the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, which is an ERIC within, uh, within Europe. Um, but it's not just to encourage exchange within the service providers across um, the um, members of SESTA, but also we have many people who have um, um, shown up here today who are from other um, archives and repositories outside of SESTA, um, but also um, many researchers and uh, other stakeholders who have an interest in, in the topic of new data types. Um, most importantly, um, we hope that uh, the workshop will lead to uh, new and uh, creative ideas for uh, better coordination across data archives regarding how to handle new data types so that these very rich and varied um, data can be more easily uh, preserved and then disseminated uh, for, for the benefit of science. Um, let me just give a little bit of background about um, how we got here with this workshop um, for those of you who, who don't know. Um, a significant portion of the workshop was inspired by uh, some work that was carried out um, within a specific task um, called widening the perimeter of data as part of the SESTA work program of 2021 and 22. Uh, it's still ongoing, um, but we're coming close to the end now of the work done as part of um, this task. Um, so today you will hear um, three presentations, um, three out of four, that arose from the work that was done within that SESTA task. So here's an outline uh, for the afternoon. Um, so we'll spend about two hours and 20 minutes um, in total together. Um, so there will be four uh, presentations um, where you will be exposed to um, different perspectives on the challenges of working with and exploiting new data types, both from uh, archival and research perspectives. Um, these will be four 20 minute presentations um, with questions um, and answers possibly after each presentation, if the time permits, then we'll have a break and then we'll come back um, and have a more interactive um, longer uh, discussion together uh, leading up to the end. Finally, just some logistical information before we get started. Um, uh, the first thing is that the webinar will be recorded. Um, if you have questions uh, or comments, please type these into the chat. Um, and also after the presentations from each speaker, if there's time, um, I will invite you to, um, to raise a hand for um, if you want to make a comment or a question, um, or we'll just read some of the questions from the chat. Um, again, we uh, really encourage you to, to participate, to contribute, because we, we hope 
that this will be in a real exchange and not just us sort of presenting to you. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll have a more interactive session uh, in the last part. Finally, um, materials from the event, um, there will be all of the presentation slides that will be published afterwards on Zenodo. And um, there will be a link to the recording and material sent to you, um, that is to all the people who registered um, for this workshop by email. And then uh, at the very end, we, um, we ask that you complete um, the evaluation survey. So I will stop sharing my screen and now we can go to the presentations. Um, I will ask uh, Martin to share his screen. So he, he will be the first speaker. And let me take this moment to present uh, Martin Vavra. Martin works at the Institute of Sociology of the uh, Czech Academy of Sciences within the Czech Social Science Data Archive, um, which is a member of SESTA. He completed his uh, doctoral studies in sociology at the Faculty of Social Sciences of Charles University. His current research interests are mainly in the management and archiving of sociological research data and sociological research methodology. His sociological interests also include the sociology of social values and public attitudes towards foreigners. So now I turn it over to Martin. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, thank you for introduction. I think everything important about me uh, was told already. So, uh, yeah, I'm a sociologist turned uh, into archivist. And uh, today I will talk about uh, data archives and uh, what they do uh, with so called new data types and uh, what the representatives of the archives think, what is their opinion about new data types, uh, issues, uh, potential, and so on. So I will try to move to the next slide. I hope uh, you can see my presentation. Um, here is about uh, uh, actual source of uh, my presentation, uh, it's based on uh, research made in the framework of SESDA organization. It's uh, agenda 2124, and uh, here are mentioned uh, other uh, members of the team uh, that are working on uh, this topic, uh, new data types in, in archives. Okay, uh, so here is working, uh, some kind of working definition of what uh, new data types are because yeah, it's uh, uh, not uh, possible uh, to put uh, some exact definition, uh, rather it uh, can be uh, defined by opposition to traditional data types uh, 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 like survey or interview, it was, uh, traditionally and still are uh, used in social sciences, especially in sociology. Uh, so uh, for new data types, uh, it's typical that uh, they are not product of uh, scientific uh, uh, research, but uh, rather new data types, data sets are rather byproduct of, uh, for example, commercial transactions or uh, social, uh, social media uh, activities of ordinary people. And uh, from uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, characteristics of uh, new data types stems many, many new uh, uh, potential uh, new possibilities for researchers, but uh, yeah, uh, many problems for uh, archiving these types of data. Uh, are stemming from the, these characteristics as well. Uh, here, uh, for example, uh, you can see example of one of up-to-date uh, uh, research uh, article uh, using 
one of the new data types. Uh, it's based on tax records of uh, Great Britain uh, tax office. And authors of this article, uh, UK's global economic elite, uh, uh, writes that uh, using uh, this uh, individual tax data on uh, Great Britain residents uh, enabled them to reach the level of uh, granularity that would not be possible uh, if they were using uh, some traditional uh, survey data asking some sample of population. Yeah, so they are uh, uh, putting emphasis on the, on the possibilities, on the new uh, 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 research questions that can be uh, uh, passed, uh, that can be used uh, for research. But yeah, behind these uh, types of data are uh, some problems, some issues as well, especially when we uh, take them from the position of uh, data archivist. Uh, here in this table is uh, one of the possible uh, categorizations of new data types. It's based on OECD report, new data for understanding the human condition, which was published in uh, 2013. But uh, despite the fact it's nearly 10 years old, I think it's quite uh, quite uh, important, uh, interesting piece uh, describing uh, describing uh importance of uh, new types of data and uh, we use this categorization for our survey uh, among uh, european uh, data archives yeah. why archiving and sharing new data is important i think for most of you is quite uh, self-evident uh, but yeah uh, it's uh, Nearly the, nearly the same as in uh, more traditional data types. Uh, sharing uh, data uh, reduces cost of research. It uh, improves uh, comparability, reproducibility. Uh, everything uh, what we know from uh, sharing uh, or uh, what is uh, uh, typical for accessibility and sharing uh, traditional data types, it can be said about uh, sharing uh, new data types. And uh, here uh, I have a link to a uh, presentation of uh, Libby Bishop, uh, uh, German researcher with uh, uh, British origin or maybe American origin, now I'm not sure. But uh, uh, Libby Bishop is uh, uh, expert working in a German Institute Gizes, and uh, uh, she's uh, expert uh, on new data types in social science research. So uh, you can see her presentation and uh, video recording of uh, her uh, uh, webinar on uh, new types of data. Uh, I think uh, she's going. Uh, to uh, going deeper uh, on some of the uh, issues we will be talking uh, today because uh, she's concentrated on some specific topics. Uh, methodological note, uh, uh, we used very traditional tool for collecting data, uh, online uh, half standardized survey and we uh, sent a uh, link to this uh, questionnaire to representatives of uh, European data archives, to all members of CESDA and to some uh, 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 partners of CESDA in uh, non-member countries. Uh, we were quite successful regarding response rate. So uh, we uh, collected data from 24 archives ne uh, covered nearly all CESDA and uh, some uh, from some larger non-CESDA archive uh, in Europe. Okay, uh, here in the table, uh, you can see number of uh, data repositories, number of archives, uh, which uh, claimed that uh, uh, they 
uh, have in data collections uh, some uh, specific uh, new data types. Yeah. We can see that uh, most uh, widely uh, claimed uh, types were internet usage data and health data. Uh, but for example, commercial transactions data, uh, no uh, uh, of the archives, which uh, completed the survey in uh, a year ago, uh, could uh, claim that uh, they have uh, this type of data, uh, despite the fact that in uh, many uh, research or methodological articles, we can read that uh, commercial transactions data uh, have, has a huge potential, but uh, for their uh, characteristics, uh, their com commercial uh, characteristic, and um, from maybe some other issues. Uh, no of the archives, uh, which uh, completed uh, the survey questionnaire, uh, said that uh, they have this kind of uh, data in their, uh, their data collection. Uh, you can see here word cloud, but uh, it's uh, rather for uh, for illustration, uh, the word cloud is based on uh, responses to open-ended questions. So uh, yeah, uh, we asked uh, the representatives uh, if they marked uh, uh, variant uh, that they have some other data type, uh, what these concrete data are. So here you can see that, uh, for example, uh, they have some uh, historical uh, or data uh, from historians, some uh, traffic patterns data, or for example, um, uh, musicology data, some recordings of, of uh, uh, for example, traditional or folk music and so on. So yeah, uh, we can see that there are some, uh, some uh, new uh, data types, data sets in the archives, but yeah, in fact, uh, when we take uh, that, uh, we had uh, 24 archives in our survey. It's not so much uh, widespread. And uh, yeah, if we divide the archives in uh, very roughly into uh, two groups, uh, uh, one group uh, smaller archives and uh, the second uh, larger archives. So uh, we can see that uh, these new data types are concentrated mostly in the larger archives like uh, mentioned uh, German uh, Gizes or, for example, uh, UK-based uh, uh, UK data uh, service, or, for example, uh, in uh, Netherlands uh, data, data archive. Uh, challenges. It's very important for uh, uh, CESDA organization uh, to know what are issues, what are challenges, what are problems connected with new data types. So uh, here it's a very aggregated, uh, uh, aggregated index, but uh, uh, we can say uh, that uh, most problematic or perceived as most problematic are internet usage data, uh, tracking data and has data. And, uh, uh, in the second group, uh, perceived as uh, uh, less problematic, uh, connected with uh, less intensity of problems, uh, are uh, government transactions data, uh, government registration records, and uh, some uh, uh, geographic uh, satellite data. Uh, and um, here, uh, in my opinion, uh, we can see part of the explanation yeah, because uh, uh, when I aggregated uh, uh, the issues, uh, not from the, uh, uh, for the individual types of data, but uh, for through the, all the types, uh, this uh, concentration on individual types of problems. So we can see that uh, this most serious problem uh, legal and ethical and uh, data protection issues are uh, perceived and uh, technical issues. And uh, when we uh, go back, uh, so uh, internet usage data, uh, health data, tracking data, these are uh, uh, 
examples of data which are connected both uh, with uh, very uh, strongly uh, to both uh, kinds of problems uh, legal problems because for example internet usage data uh, has some copyright issues uh, uh, has uh, some uh, data protection issues typically and at the same time uh, as internet usage data uh, are frequently uh, uh, less structured compared to for example some uh, government registration records so uh, there are uh, technical problems coming as well yeah, so uh, it's only hypothesis but i think quite uh, uh, well founded that uh, internet usage data health data tracking data are very strongly connected uh, to both kinds of problems which are uh, perceived as most serious legal problems ethical problems and uh, technical issues and uh, when we go to uh, the bottom of seriousness uh, of uh, the, the problems uh, we can see that uh, uh, metadata schemes and uh, metadata uh, access roads to data are uh, seen by uh, archives representatives uh, as uh, least serious so probably uh, the uh, metadata uh, uh, schemas uh, as a DDI in the perception of uh, data archives are uh, possible to be used even for uh, new data types and uh, yeah, uh, probably uh, archives, most of the archives has some solutions uh, for uh, access to data, uh, even for new data types. So it's not perceived as so serious compared to uh, the legal or technical issues. Okay. Uh, and uh, what can be solutions uh, for the for the problems? Uh, so uh, I think uh, the possible solutions uh, that uh, uh, representatives of data archives uh, suggested I, are quite traditional. And yeah, probably it's not possible uh, to invent um, anything totally uh, new. So uh, they asked for uh, some training of data management of new data, sharing best practices regarding the new data types, archiving, uh, uh, asking for uh, creating some online forums for knowledge exchange. And they ask uh, for some coordinated uh, SESDA action. Yeah, because uh, I go here. Um, in opinion of uh, archives, uh, SESDA is important, especially on the European or even uh, global level, because individual archives, even the large ones, uh, are not uh, important or not, it's not a good word, but yeah, uh, even the large archives are not so big players in the game uh, to be heard uh, in some uh, European negotiations, but SESDA as a part of uh, European uh, scientific infrastructure can be. Yeah. So uh, they are calling uh, for SESDA to play uh, some role in uh, negotiations on the European level uh, or to, uh, to be expert, uh, to play some expert role in uh, these negotiations with, uh, for example, uh, social media platforms or uh, some uh, statistical, official statistics institutions. And uh, important areas uh, for support, um, yeah, especially it was uh, legal and ethical issues. Again, it's quite logical. It was perceived as a most serious problem and uh, some technical solutions. Uh, here are uh, some uh, more detailed ways of, of uh, how to uh, help uh, individual service providers or individual archives, uh, help them uh, to deal with uh, uh, new data types. So some of them are very, very concrete, but they are 
expressing uh, basic basic ways uh, of uh, assistance like uh, um, doing some expert seminars or uh, joint sessions with other uh, infrastructures uh, which have uh, some experience with new data types okay uh, i was talking uh, uh, about this uh, role possible role of, of sesda and uh, another uh, role uh, of sesda or some uh, other uh, uh, umbrella institutions uh, on the european level uh, can be in organizing working group uh, with uh, uh, representatives from service providers from archives uh, uh, on uh, which uh, should prepare some some uh, guidelines uh, with uh, best practices uh, for uh, most uh, important uh, types of data so which are uh, or can be uh, some social media data uh, which are quite important in uh, social scientific research but uh, which are at the same time very hard uh, uh, to be uh, stored to be archived to be shared so uh, archives are asking for some uh, guidance some uh, assistance some knowledge uh, about how to deal uh, with this types of data and conclusions from our survey so yeah we can see that uh, uh, Aside of traditional data, which is still core of the data collections, uh, are some new non-traditional big uh, data files in the archives, but um, not many. Uh, only in few large archives uh, we can see some uh, significant uh, or some larger numbers of, for example, social, social media data. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, especially among smaller archives we can see a general lack of experience in working with new data types uh, and because without uh, data is no experience and uh, without experience uh, there is uh, hesitation in uh, this uh, these service providers to accept uh, uh, data into their collections so how uh, to get from this vicious circle is uh, um, exactly through uh, the, uh, uh, some assistance, some uh, mutual support, some uh, creating, uh, creating guidelines and so on. Yeah. It's very hard for individual archive to get uh, some, some knowledge, to get some experience uh, without uh, this, uh, this kind of concerted action. Uh, reasons uh, behind this uh, general lack of new data uh, can be uh, can be more complicated uh, it's not uh, only about uh, lack of experience and expertise but yeah uh, for example on some uh, national uh, levels uh, uh, there uh, is not uh, possible or that is in the uh, uh, there are not enough uh, specific types of data uh, for example especially in some uh, some uh, smaller smaller countries uh, or uh, they can be some uh, specialized institutions uh, for disseminating uh, specific uh, types of data uh, for example some uh, administrative data so for the data archives uh, it's not possible uh, to get to this data meaningfully because there is some other institutions which was designed uh, for uh, um, archiving and uh, disseminating uh, some specific types of data. Uh, typically, uh, when uh, uh, statistical offices uh, themselves are disseminating uh, primary data from uh, they, uh, which they collected. So it's not only about uh, service providers, about uh, problems of data archives, but uh, uh, frequently it's dependent on some specific national situation. And uh, um, yeah, uh, issues uh, uh, which are uh, 
perceived as more serious. Uh, we could see that uh, it's, uh, these are legal and ethical um, issues connected uh, with probably all types of uh, uh, new data types, but most uh, strongly with uh, uh, health data and uh, with uh, uh, internet-based data and uh, technical issues connected, uh, especially with, uh, with uh, internet data and uh, um, health, uh, health data. Uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, it's uh, the uh, last uh, uh, last message from our survey. Um, among the archives, there is uh, very strong recognition, very strong opinion that new data types are important and it's important uh, to uh, try to get them into the data collections and uh, try to uh, bring them to other researchers. But yeah, uh, this uh, recognition frequently is not connected with uh, a real situation uh, because uh, in reality, uh, in most of the archives, uh, there are no new data types, uh, new data types data sets. So thank you. It's uh, all uh, for now. Thanks, Martin. Um, I think we have a moment uh, for any questions or comments. Um, I would be curious to know if if the people um, participating um, have other views about why why there is not really that much new data new data types coming into the archives within within Europe because I think we all probably would agree although maybe not <laughs> that there's a lot of research being done with new data types for example with social media data or linked administrative data and so on. So we have, I think we could agree that there's a lot that's being produced and used, but very little coming into archives. And Martin is, well, also in collaboration with our task group, put forward a few hypotheses about why this is the case, but maybe, maybe you have other ideas. Does anybody have any other thoughts about why this is the case? Why is there so little making its way into data archives? And is this going to be a long-term problem or, or is it just because we're, we're not at the, at the deluge yet, the flood of new data that will be coming our way? And if you want to make a comment uh, orally and not through the chat, I think you would have to raise your, your virtual hand. If it's not the case, um, you can maybe think about this um, while you're listening to the next presentations and we can come back to this question later. I'm looking now at um, something that just came into the chat. I'll take a moment to, uh, to have a look or maybe I'll read it out loud from Rostislav who says, uh, hello, thank you very much for this opportunity to know more about archives activities in social science areas. I'd like to ask Dr. Vavra, what are the main ethical issues from his sociological perspective? So what might be the role of critical sociologists knowing and reflecting these issues? How can he disseminate the data and balance the power between systems? Do you have other particular answers about ethical and legal questions. Uh, and the last question regards big data in, in the hands of global institutions. So what will be the role dealing with this new hyper object in modern societies? And I think it's, well, I, it seems clear, but Martin, do you have, would you like to respond to this? Uh, okay, I will uh, try to uh, respond quickly. Thank you for the uh, question. Uh, yeah, uh, now I will uh, stay in, uh, on the ground <laughs> uh, and uh, I will answer from uh, archive perspective because ethical issues uh, 
connected uh, to data and data collection and data dissemination. There uh, are many, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, they are very crucial, uh, very strongly connected to uh, uh, personal data protection. Uh, for example, in relation to uh, social media data, it's a, a very uh, hard to collect data uh, uh, which are uh, totally anonymous or to anonymize fully uh, social media data if you are collecting uh, content from the social media. Yeah, because uh, when, for example, uh, individual uh, tweets or Facebook posts uh, uh, are still kept uh, on um, uh, social media uh, accounts. So even if you delete uh, names of, or some concrete, uh, concrete uh, 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 identifying data, uh, so you still uh, frequently can uh, identify the author yeah, of the uh, of the data. So they, they are uh, really uh, hard, really uh, crucial uh, ethical ethical problems. Yeah. So I know that, uh, uh, for example, there are some guidelines, ethical guidelines for uh, collecting Twitter data, uh, not uh, even only for archives, but for researchers themselves, uh, and uh, which are distinguishing. Uh, between types of authors of, uh, of tweets. Uh, uh, there is important if institution or individual person account uh, uh, is the origin of the, of the tweet and so, so on. So yeah, there are many, many problems connected with uh, mainly uh, uh, personal data protection. Yeah. Because uh, Fundamentally, it's not totally different from traditional data, but when you are doing survey, uh, it's not, uh, in most of the cases, uh, so hard to anonymize data. But uh, when you are doing uh, research on social media, uh, typically, uh, typically it's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite hard uh, to do anonymization. And uh, uh, this is the same typically with, uh, uh, the health records, uh, for example. So, yeah, uh, and uh, what is the role of data archives? I think uh, data archives themselves uh, are not uh, uh, strong enough or they don't have enough expertise to uh, solve fundamentally some uh, high level ethical problems, but uh, data archives can help to formulate some of these problems, yeah, which uh, should be uh, solved uh, by some ethical panels and uh, data archives can help uh, uh, to create uh, the guidelines, for example, or uh, best case scenarios with the relations, uh, relation uh, to these ethical problems to think about uh, or to take uh, this ethical problem seriously for the workings of data archives. But yeah, I, uh, don't want to tell uh, too much about it. It can be, uh, uh, it's a really, a really serious problem and uh, we could talk about it uh, for hours. So yeah, uh, in simple uh, this way. Uh, and uh, yeah, a big data and uh, their property. Uh, uh, yeah, again, uh, very, uh, very, uh, important problem which can be uh, solved from the position of, of uh, data archives, but yeah, it's uh, real problems. And as uh, we could see uh, in the data archives collections, uh, there are no uh, commercial um, transaction data, for example. Yeah. But how to solve it? Uh, yeah, uh, I I don't know. Yeah, we can talk about it, but. Mm -hmm. I don't have solution. Uh, thanks. Um, I think I would like to to move on because uh, just in the interest of time and keeping a bit to the schedule, I noticed um, an interesting um, 
comment from Tuomas uh, from uh, FSD in Finland. And I, I would propose that we come back to, um, to his comment in either after the next presentation or in the discussion part um, towards the end. Um, it's, worth, it's worth coming back to that. So thanks, Martin. Uh, let's move on. Um, I think um, if you can stop sharing your screen, yeah, I, will, sure. I will share mine because I am the next, next presenter. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm uh, from FORCE, Brian Kleiner, um, in Switzerland, and we are sort of the national service provider, the main uh, research infrastructure for the social sciences in, in the country. And my, um, well, I'm the head of data services within FORCE, and my professional interests focus around things having to do with open science, data management, and research infrastructure development. So let me share my screen with my presentation. And I will get started. Okay, so I think I, I can catch us up a bit with the time because Martin has already sort of presented some of the possible forms um, of exchange and collaboration so that service providers, data archives within SESTA, outside of SESTA can better um, work together and support each other in different ways. Um, so Martin, Martin's presentation was uh, looking at the current status of uh, archives and how they are um, handling new data types. Um, of course, you know how much they're actually getting and then what are their real capacities and challenges um, for what is coming in and, and also what might be coming in in the future. So um, this presentation, which is uh, again a collaboration with uh, the colleagues that you see here on the screen, um, is more future oriented. So the question that we pose um, and that we pose to you, especially today is, um, how can we prepare ourselves for what we assume will come? That is more and more do da new data types um, that go beyond sort of the traditional data that, that we're very comfortable with in handling. So we assume that it's coming. And the question is, how do we better prepare for that moment so that when it does come, we are not overwhelmed um, and incapable of of doing what will be needed. So these are the questions I think that all data archives should be asking themselves at this point. So first of all, well, we've all been hearing about uh, the data deluge, uh, especially new data types that are gonna be coming our way uh, in the future, but well, so far, apparently we're not really seeing it. We are not experiencing this deluge. Um, we're getting cases here and there in the archives, um, but we're not overwhelmed for sure. So when's it going to come and under what conditions? And the question that is related to that is, well, will, be, will we be ready for that when it does come? And then uh, related to that, um, where are the main gaps? in capacity and skills um, within, within uh, data archives. And of course, we are thinking about SESTA. Um, that was our task um, within uh, the work program within SESTA. But of course, these questions apply not just to SESTA archives, but to, to all institutions that are storing and will be storing um, new data types in, in the future. And so that was the first set of questions. And then the question that I would like to raise um, now for my presentation is more uh, um, pragmatic. That is, uh, how, do we, how do we pool our existing resources to prepare for these new data types that presumably will be coming our way in the future? What can we do collectively together um, to benefit from our existing um, knowledge and skills 
and also fill in the gaps where, where these are lacking um, within institutions and then uh, across, across institutions or archives. And then related to that, um, what mechanisms can we put into place that will allow us to, um, to adapt um, and then to respond um, in an appropriate way? And then more generally, you know, where do we go from here? Um, should we wait for the deluge to come and then deal with it when it arrives? Or should we start to make some preparations? And if you think about a real deluge, um, it's not usually wise to wait for the flood to come your way. It's <laughs> always a bit smarter to, uh, to do what you can ahead of time if you expect it to come um, so that you won't be in trouble. So within our task, um, based on what we heard from other SESTA service providers in the survey you saw in a few of Martin's slides, um, some specific suggestions that were sent to us. And so we, we took what we learned from our colleagues um, from the survey. Uh, we had quite a lot of discussions ourselves about, well, how might we in the future coordinate across our institutions um, in, in smart ways and ways that would not be necessarily too um, resource intensive because we all, uh, of course, are faced with many different um, uh, challenges, responsibilities, um, and we don't have infinite uh, resources to, uh, to address those. And so we, we, we came up um, with three main um, categories. Um, this is what we think might make sense going forward as a way of sort of organizing um, our, our ideas um, regarding possible forms of, of coordination. So we came up with three main uh, areas. One we call forums for exchange of expertise. Um, the second one we are calling uh, shared written materials. And the last one we call impact. And I'll just go through these briefly with three slides. So for the first one, this could involve um, setting up uh, different channels for sharing existing expertise across service providers. Um, of course, we can be we can open this to other institutions outside of SESTA who have an interest. Um, and so channels could have different forms themselves. So we can imagine, for example, um, an email list simply, but then there are also certainly more um, sophisticated ways and channels to share expertise across institutions. Another idea um, that falls under this category is uh, periodic workshops um, where you could uh, identify um, available expertise within service providers, but also identify um, needs within the service providers. One kind of um, uh, good way of doing that within the SESTA context are um, the annual um, SESTA expert seminars where representatives from different service providers come together and focus on a particular theme. So we can imagine, for example, an expert seminar um, that focuses on new data types in the future. Um, another idea would be to establish sort of a division of labor. So not all of the um, service providers within SESTA um, have all of the needed expertise, but maybe collectively um, we cover most of the bases re regarding the specific challenges, for example, um, uh, data protection challenges or technical challenges. And so it could be that we um, establish a division of labor um, where we identify the experts within the different service providers and we name them and we add them, let's say, to a list, um, for example, for expertise in um, formats uh, for different new data types or metadata um, relating to specific um, new data types uh, or um, schemes for uh, accessing 
um, these data types, which in many cases can, can be especially sensitive and, um, and delicate. Another, another possibility is having what you might call the open hours format. So it's where people from different institutions can come online and just have an exchange on a, on a regular basis um, to learn about and, and to talk about particular relevant topics. So this could be organized um, within the context of SESTA, but of course it could be, it could be open as well to, um, to people from other institutions who would be interested. And then last within this category, to consider um, what we call eclectic affinity. So um, within SESTA, there are many different um, activities um, and other projects which have relationships or touch on um, things related to uh, new data types. And so there might be ways to, um, to find synergies across those activities and projects. So that's what we came up with for this, um, perhaps you would have other ideas, which we would be really happy to, um, to take later on. Um, so the second category is shared written materials. So what we heard from this survey from our colleagues is that it would be good to have written guidance um, that could be referred to um, for particular challenges. So within an archive, if you receive um, some data set, um, you're not sure how to how to handle it well, you can go and, and look into some written materials that are available where you might get your, your answers. Um, and so this could have the form of uh, handbooks, it could be checklists for how to handle particular data types, it could be case studies for how a particular institution did handle a particularly difficult um, case. And then, um, it could be that um, these forms of guidance documents could be published uh, on the SESTA resource directory. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this is an online um, repository of um, uh, documents that come from the different SESTA service providers. And that can be of interest to all of the SESTA service providers, but also others who are dealing with um, archiving issues. Where, um, where you might um, make use of these um, uh, within your own institution. Um, another possibility is that um, some of these documents within this um, SESTA resource directory could be referred to within the SESTA data archiving guide. And this is another online, online resource um, collectively from SESTA that helps um, service providers, repositories and archives to, um, to know how to, uh, to archive and, and to understand the best practices. So there's, um, these materials could be integrated there. And then finally, coming close to the end now, um, impact. And so what we mean by impact is um, kind of monitoring uh, regularly um, what's going on within archives, what's going on within the larger landscape with respect to uh, new data types, updating and refining our understanding, our conceptual framework for new data types. Um, yeah, monitoring um, to see, let's say, if more and more new data types are arriving in archives and why certain types are or aren't. Um, and then sort of, fixing objectives and monitoring objectives across service providers um, uh, with respect to new data types. Um, another thing that we might do together is once we have sort of put into place these different forms of collaboration, well, we could also evaluate how effective they are so that our precious resources are being used uh, in, in the best way um, to have the, the, the greatest effect um, so that in the end, we are all better, um, better um, equipped to handle new data types. Um, and then finally, um, we have this notion of scenario planning. So doing sort of regular SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, 
opportunities and threats um, so that we can, we can be more um, confident that service providers will be kind of future proof in dealing with new data types. So I've already taken probably too much time. I think maybe since we don't want, I don't want to um, prevent my colleagues in the next presentations for having their full time. I think what I will do is wait um, for the discussion session to see if you have other ideas about other kinds of collaboration that you think might be promising um, in the future. So we'll hold on this, but please, that's really the most crucial for us in, in especially in our task, because we want to make sure that we're going forward in the right way. And here's my last slide. Um, just some things to keep in mind that we need to keep in mind in the future um, when we try to enact our ideas for capacity building um, within archives uh, for new data types. So there, one thing to keep in mind is that there might be general capacity building activities that we can put into place, but we also need to have mechanisms for being responsive um, to new challenges that they arise in the form of, well, we have a problem, how do we fix it? Um, another thing is that in order to make these forms of collaboration work, we definitely will need to strengthen our lines of communication across archives. So we have this already, especially within our projects, our SESTA projects, but I think we need to build new lines of communication. We need to encourage small scale pilot collaborations related to new data types maybe between two or three archives who could then share what they learn with others. Um, and then um, again, rely on the SESTA resource directory to publish our written materials. Um, one possibility um, is uh, to create a special um, directory within the um, research directory just for new data types so that you could go into the directory and you can open a tab that would be new data types and find all of the things that have been published in there that are relevant, that might be relevant for you. Um, and then, um, yeah, an important consideration is that, you know, together, um, at least within the sex SESTA context, we can do more or less, but this will depend to some extent on the resources made available, not just within the service providers, but also within the SESTA work program in the future. And this is very uncertain at the moment. So we have to kind of modulate our um, work and our expectations according to available resources. Um, this means going faster or slower according to how much can be invested in this work. Um, and then one last thing I would just like to mention is that um, we cannot do any of this work um, to facilitate um, the archiving and dissemination of new data types for secondary or reuse purposes without the collaboration of, of researchers who are working to produce or use new data and other stakeholders who have an interest in the topic. So I think I will stop there. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and that way we can regroup, see where we are. Um, I think we are, according to my schedule, a few minutes behind. Um, I think maybe we could take a question or two or we save these, any questions for the last session. I'm being hopeful that we all have enough time in the last session to cover all the questions. I don't see any hands. I don't see any comments or questions in the chat. In that case, maybe we can move to our third presentation from Yevon Voronin. And so let me say a few words about Yevon before he starts his presentation. Yevon is a social researcher with expertise in quantitative methods and uh, cultural sociology. He completed his bachelor's degree in sociology at the National University of Kiev, 
Moila Academy in Kyiv, Ukraine. And he has a master's degree in sociology and social, social research at the University of Cologne uh, in Germany. He even joined GASIS uh, Data Services for the Social Sciences in 2021 to work as part of the SESTA training team. As for research activities, he was part of a team studying social media data, sharing intentions in academia. Kevin. All right, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, uh, that's right, my name is Yevhen. I'm going to present uh, today uh, the study on social media data sharing in social research uh, conducted by Gezi's team, by Ezra, Johannes, Karen, and me. It was a collaboration uh, of two departments um, to run this online survey among authors of the social sciences who actually use social media data uh, for their research. I will start with a short introduction. As we have already mentioned, social media data as a type of new data type, as kind of new data type, uh, became an important data source in social science. We can see an increased number uh, that scientific publications uh, used uh, social media data to gain insights into human behavior. Uh, of course, social media data offers a broad range of topics. Uh, we need to less effort maybe to collect data, get a broad range of topics, uh, large samples, uh, high temporal resolution. But one precondition for researchers actually to, uh, to work with social media data is that if the, they uh, can access them. However, access to the social media data is associated with new challenges um, such as technical expertise or expertise or legal regulations, ethical uncertainties, etc. And uh, therefore, um, one potential consequence is a gap uh, between people who, between researchers who have data and people, uh, researchers who do not have access to social media data. And sharing uh, social media data with uh, others, uh, with, with other researchers to be reused beyond the original purpose of collection uh, can reduce and prevent inequality gap in this data access. Apart from this, of course, there are more, uh, much more reasons for sharing social media data. Uh, for example, a matter of, eth matter of ethics, compliance with the community, motives to make research uh, transparent, reproducible, replicable, etc. But in contrast to with reasons to share their data, there are also, also barriers to sharing research, uh, to sharing social media data, and uh, uh, different reasons. We identified several reasons that might be relevant for social media data, like that preparing data is resource intensive. Um, people might get not enough credit uh, for data sharing, uh, might be lack of confidence and knowledge. Uh, then uh, data protection law, certain uh, terms of service for, of platforms, uh, informed consent issue, uh, other, other ethical challenges, and even lack of common standards. Uh, our research, we collected data or the original survey data to investigate, uh, firstly, of course, um, experiences with data sharing, especially past data sharing experience and challenges and uh, reasons for past, uh, past data sharing decisions, but also uh, intentions to share the data, to share uh, the, the social media data and the role of uh, past experience in predicting the intentions to share data and the role of the such called components of theory of planned behavior, the role of attitudes, subjective norms and behavioral control, meaning autonomy or capacity to share data. And uh, in addition to this, also differences between uh, different types of data sharing, because people might share data publicly with restricted access or upon personal request. That's our theoretical model that we will, uh, that I will show you uh, in more details later uh, when we go to the results. So our uh, data is available online, data from online survey among authors who actually used social media data and uh, published journal articles uh, based on social media data between 2018-2021, had a list of 
uh, journal articles. Uh, there's a list of journals uh, collected information and asked uh, authors to participate in the survey. A new version is available online, version 1.1. And uh, as you can see, the questionnaire covers uh, different sections. And feel free to reuse the data. Um, you can download it from the GESIS uh, website. Uh, so then uh, the results section I will present right now will follow this structure. Firstly, I will show some frequencies for closed-ended questions, focusing on intentions to share data, actually um, which platforms were used, uh, the data originated from, then use data acquisition methods, challenges for sharing social media data, then we go to reasons that people actually mentioned in the, uh, in the survey, uh, for share and or not share their data. And uh, at the end, I'll go to the result of our linear regression uh, per intention to share data publicly under control by access and upon personal request. So uh, first of all, some descriptors. Uh, overall, 1,738 uh, authors were contacted. We had a 20% response rate, 253 responses. Uh, four people were excluded because they reported not using social metadata, particularly. And our analytical sim sample consists of 249 uh, respondents. As for previous experience, it's quite interesting that around 34% uh, actually used secondary social media data, and 38% uh, shared their primary uh, social media, the primary social media data. Around 18%, uh, 44 respondents reported using repositories or archives to share uh, their social media data in the past. Regarding intentions to, say, to share uh, social media data in the past, it's, it was a key uh, concept of, of our research. And the operationalization of the data sharing intention was defined using TACT framework. And we ask respondents to report how likely are they to share social media to share it's the action social media data is for the context with others outside of research team for the target and within the, within the next three years as a part of time and we ask them for three modes public with no restrictions uh, under controlled access that regulates if and how data may be used by others and upon personal requests some kind of informal sharing when being contacted directly by other researchers uh, or anyone interested in the data. And you can see the, uh, the mean score here on the slide. And the mean score is much higher for sharing upon personal request that might require low, that might uh, be related to low publicity and less effort to share data upon personal request rather than publicly. Uh, then, and uh, the difference between sharing personal requests and publicly is around 1.4. Uh, points. So uh, our respond our respondents used uh, social media data from different platforms. As you can see, around eighty two percent used data from Twitter, then sixty seven from Facebook, forty three from YouTube. After that, we uh, had thirty seven percent who used Instagram, twenty six Reddit, and uh, other used Wikipedia, Telegram, TikTok, and also other social media. Uh, platforms. Um, data acquisition methods that people actually use to access social media data can be also some kind of divided into collecting primary data. For example, uh, when you use API or web scraping, or you manually collect some data, and secondary data when you download them from the repository, archive, etc. In our sample, the most uh, popular data acquisition method was uh, to use APIs when the web scraping and also manual collection. Um, repositories uh, and archives, in contrast, used only approximately 20% of our respondents to get there uh, to, uh, to find their data. So we're going, we're moving to the open ended questions. Uh, we implemented ad hoc coding and uh, the analysis for reasons for sharing social media data that people articulate uh, identified so so-called three key reasons. The first one 
is some kind of uh, awareness that data sharing is a prerequisite to foster open science, to, uh, foster transparency, research findings, reproducibility, replicability. The second one is related to research self-interest and uh, interest in collaboration to help colleagues, cooperation, cooperation, uh, and other potential uh, opportunities. And the third one is related more to uh, some kind of requirements to share the data, some kind of stakeholders requirements uh, that uh, well, when they're required to make data sharing obligatory for funding and or publications. As you can see, the most popular were foster open science to help colleagues, uh, create transparency, research findings, and uh, cooperation, cooperation reasons. We also asked people why, uh, what were the reasons they did not share their data, although they collected uh, it uh, in the past, they collected them in the past. And uh, again, we implemented ad hoc coding and extracted such common uh, categories. And the most popular uh, was that sharing was not even considered or needed. Uh, around 31% uh, mentioned this as the main, uh, as one of the reasons. Legal and ethical reasons took second and third place uh, in our survey. Before going to the regression analysis, uh, one slide about challenges. Uh, respondents were also asked to report uh, legal and ethical challenges uh, they faced when sharing in the past or considering to share uh, social media data. Uh, and uh, the result showed that the strongest concern was about people's privacy, as you can see on this slide, then uncertainties regarding uncertainties regarding legal regulations, and uh, in the third place, terms of service of data sources that do not uh, permit sharing uh, their data. The results of the study some kind of show that the most real and perceived challenges relate to legal uh, questions. Of course, it's not uh, something new, it's not surprising. And uh, especially because researchers in social science and behavioral uh, sciences typically do not have this extended legal uh, expertise uh, that might uh, perceive this as a potential challenge. So uh, now we're moving to the main part uh, to assess the uh, differential importance of various uh, predictors for future uh, social media data sharing and for the future intentions for different sharing options publicly under controlled access and upon personal request we calculated three separate uh, hierarchical meaning blockwise regression models uh, one model per data sharing type the first block uh, included only control variables gender and uh, whether the respondent is a professor or not and uh, has a professorship or not. And uh, the second block was past experiences, meaning whether they used secondary data, meaning reuse someone's data, then uh, whether they shared their data in the past, and the importance of perceived challenges uh, for in terms of term of service, legal uncertainties, and people's privacy. The, those are top three from uh, these uh, frequencies. Then uh, the third step, uh, includes the component of uh, the theory of planned behavior. I mean, uh, how, how valuable it is for respondents to share their data, whether they recognize the value or not. Then expectations of researchers, some kind of peer pressure that they might feel and uh, capacity and autonomy of researchers to share their data. In the first, mo in the first model, the outcome variable was uh, public sharing, the first column. And um, this process indicates a positive B coefficient in the second and or in the third block uh, with P value lower than 0, 0, 0 0.05. And we can see that uh, uh, sharing data in the past emerged as a positive predictor uh, for public sharing. And uh, when adding uh, components from the theory of planned behavior, uh, first three uh, categories, uh, whether people recognize the value, expectations of researchers, and capacity uh, played a significant role here. 
and MERSOC as positive predictors. However, when we go to the model with the dependent variable intentions to share under controlled access, um, sharing data in the past uh, was also a significant positive predictor, but as well as whether they reused data, used secondary data in the past. Um, also in this step, uh, the next step, or adding uh, components of theory of plan behavior, we can see uh, that while expectations of other researchers and own capacity were significant for in the first model, in the second model, for the under controlled access, uh, access, this was not the case. Uh, however, the perception of, of sharing, because the perception of sharing as a valuable was a significant predictor here. Compared to public sharing and sharing under controlled access, when we speak about intention to share one personal request, uh, the results are a little bit different. And here, uh, perceived challenges play a much greater role. Concerns related to platform terms of service and legal regulations uh, and legal uncertainties were significant positive predictors in the model. And speaking about components or the theory of plain behavior, the perception of sharing as valuable, also a positive predictor. Uh, but what is different here, another positive predictor was uh, perceived autonomy. And similar to the model, uh, yeah, similar to the, to the first uh, and second model, and third model, perception as a valuable also was a positive predictor. Here you can see uh, the results in more uh, statistical way with uh, confidence intervals and uh, uh, in the graph where you can check them after the slides are preserved uh, on the model. So uh, I would like to sum up uh, with this discussion slide. Uh, first of all, we identified that reasons for sharing social media data can be actually divided in kind of three groups when we speak about idealistic altruistic reasons, um, some self-serving reasons for credits and other uh, aspects, and then compliance motives with some requirements and uh, requirements for problem from journals or funders. Uh, the reasons that prevent Researchers from sharing social media data actually legal ethical challenges, then lack of uh, resources, repositories, or knowledge for to do this, as well as lack of value, uh, benefit, and usefulness uh, for them. Above all, uh, the results of the study when I speak about regression analysis and our main theoretical model predicting intentions to share data. It showed that researchers uh, would more likely to share their data um, if they have already did this in the past, for example, and that they reused some social media data. If there is some external pressure, meaning expectations uh, from other researchers, if they have a positive opinion of data sharing and uh, some kind of recognize the value or perceives it as a valuable for, for data for use. And uh, if they're capable, capable of and autonomous, capable for public sharing and autonomous for sharing upon personal request with respect to sharing their data. Uh, of course, the predictors play uh, both past experience and components of theory of bad behavior play a role here. It depends on the mode of sharing. But what's, what's crucial here to not only take into account and address the specific attributes of social media data and uh, some characteristics of the data, but also the experiences, attitudes, norms, and this perceived behavioral control among researchers who collect and work with this uh, social media data. That's my main uh, message from this uh, presentation of our empirical study. Well, thank you very much. I'll be happy to participate in the panel discussion. And if you have any direct questions, feel free to ask them now. Thanks, Kevin. Really interesting. Um, my, one of my takeaways um, from your presentation is that actually one of the reasons 
why archives are not getting so much might have to do as much with the researchers as it does with the archives themselves, or even more so um, with the difficulties of sharing or it's not being part of the experience or culture of the researchers who are working with these types of data to try to make them available through archives. Um, but I see that there is a question. I think we have time for, for a question or two. Um, this is from Johanna in the chat. Um, you can read it as well, um, Nathan. How difficult is it for researchers to obtain social media data? Is it something very time consuming, difficult and related to their know-how? If yes, isn't their reluctance to share the data something like that everyone make the effort themselves and the way how to protect their know-how? All right, thank you for this question. Uh, I think the difficulty depends on the research question and the kind of data they actually collect, whether they collect primary data or not, and uh, from which platforms the data originate from and what kind of uh, variables researchers are interested in. As I understand, the main uh, point here is whether this difficulty might be related to the uh, people's uh, intentions to share data and whether they did in the past. And here, I might refer to our slide why they uh, um, why people who collected primary data in our sample did not share it. And uh, as you can see, among the main reasons uh, are the sharing are not considered legal reasons, ethical reasons, but also for the first place that were, they were not allowed uh, from someone to share this data, or they think that data are not usable, or there might be some restrictions, at least perceived restrictions, uh, maybe formal, maybe informal uh, of institution, this lack of know-how information, lack of cooperation in resources, lack of some kind of incentives, and uh, no knowledge about uh, a lack of knowledge about suitable archive repository and the way how to do this. Uh, of course, uh, for certain cases, uh, difficult the effort that people put into collecting data might be also considered as. Uh, potential reasons for not sharing data. However, in our sample, those were the main uh, categories that we found. Okay, thanks. Um, I actually have another question, but I'm, I'm worried about the time. But maybe I'll just a quick question to you, Yevin, just give an intuitive response, because I think it might be difficult to, <laughs> to answer this, but I would remind everybody that the results from the survey are regarding the social media data. Huh? So we're not talking about all me, um, new data types. My, my question to you is, do you have a feeling, a sense of the extent to which these results would generalize to other new data types, or is it too difficult to say? Uh, that's actually a very good question for the uh, discussion with other participants. And uh, it's quite difficult to conclude in this case. Of course, uh, you might uh, find some more or less uh, common patterns concerning different data types, but some of them, some of the reasons might be prominent only for social media data, especially when speaking about terms of services yes. uh, and uh, whether, uh, whether researchers uh, can share their data if they use web scrapping when web scrapping is not allowed uh, or is not uh, recommended uh, mm -hmm. this way by some social media platforms. Those are, I think, distinct for social media data, but many other aspects we might find also when we consider other new data types. Yes. Well, maybe we can come back to this um, question uh, in the discussion session. What I would propose now, if this is okay for everyone, um, since it's been an hour and a half until now, is that we take the break now for 10 minutes, and then we come back for uh, Pascal's presentation. Um, and then for the remaining time, about 20 minutes, we'll have um, our discussion session.
Um, let's do that. I think it's probably the good moment for a break. And during that during that time, please think about things that you would like to um, to discuss later. So see you all. Let's say at 3:40 Central East um, Central European time. 3:40. Thanks. See you soon. Okay. Well, let's get started promptly with the last part uh, of the workshop. Um, so um, let's go to our final speaker. Um, today um, we have uh, Pascal um, Jorgens. Um, Pascal is a computational social scientist and incoming professor of computational communication science at the University of Trier, uh, Germany. His work involves the development and validation of quantitative methods with a special focus on the collection of structured and unstructured web content, as well as behavioral data. Some of his topical research deals with influences of algorithmic platforms on individuals and society, changes in political communication and fragmentation of communication. Pascal? Many thanks. I don't have a full presentation, but I'll share one key slide that summarizes um, what I want to tell you. And first off, maybe um, I should highlight that my role here is explicitly as sort of a practitioner in that I'm not working in an archive and have, to be honest, um, played the role of my own archive for most of my career. So my key point that I want to bring across is my perception as a social scientist is that we are entering a phase in history of social sciences where the challenges that we have are no longer strictly resource-based, but more kind of antagonistic. And I want to highlight and draw your attention to the fact that many of the pains and problems that we social scientists experience in our work are quite similar to what you are accustomed to, only with more pressure. So for example, just to add some numbers to the discussions that we had so far and to the examples, um, when I work with social media data, that uh, may be something like, for example, for a recent project, we downloaded 15,000 YouTube videos um, to analyze them with artificial intelligence. And that is really easy, it just took us um, half an hour of, of programming and then maybe two weeks or one week of downloading the data and another two weeks to analyze um, the material. Um, on the other hand, I have designed tracking studies where we um, recorded people's internet usage on mobile phones and that um, was basically a custom built sample that cost 50,000 Swiss francs and we worked for more than half a year to design a custom computer program to be able to collect the data. And we had an ethics board review um, and all of this. So this entire study cost definitely six figures uh, just doing this one study alone. Um, so the range is pretty broad here. And that answers one of the previous questions, uh, whether it's um, there's a incentive not to share the data. Yes, in many cases there is because um, my scientific career depends on other people not having the data, at least for some time. So coming back to the question of antagonistic challenges, I tried to structure uh, my key point in sort of two dimensions. One is the different steps of gathering data, archiving data and sharing data, which are to me the most important distinctions. And the second one is I wanted to highlight um, not just the problems that we face, but also the good things we want to realize. And this is important because more and more what we do as scientists is becoming politicized. Um, so for example, when we work with disinformation or when we work with right-wing politics or when we work with um, companies that are aggressively trying to uh, censor opposition or um, try to cover up uh, things that were not quite kosher, um, then we as scientists are suddenly entering a role in which we may be attacked legally, 
politically, personally, and so on. Just to give you an example for the, this as well, um, in the past, I have done some research on search engines. So we had a look at personalization of search engine results. The question was, um, are the things that we see different for everybody? And is there a political bias? Is there maybe a um, social demographic bias and so on? Um, and we did that kind of research and I presented this at a conference and Google sent their head of policy um, for the German, Austrian and Switzerland region. And so a top executive from Google came to the conference, paid several hundred euros to come to my talk, only my talk, stand up at the end and claim that I am a bad person and everything I ever said was wrong. So this was clearly an ad hominem attack on a scientist in a scientific context because of the research that we had been doing scientifically, carefully, and from a very neutral perspective, at least that's what I say, right? Um, so we are in this context where there is pressure from different stakeholders, from different actors, and um, it begins and permeates a lot of different stages. So what we are doing with the data collection is more and more that we are not just trying to figure out some basic research question, but it's in addition that we need to try and figure out truth in a embattled situation where societies are actively splitting up and are, um, there's internal feud. And it is becoming more and more important to document and understand this contested political reality. So that means that access to the phenomena that we want to look at is becoming more and more difficult. For example, if you want to talk to people about abortion in the United States, this will be a very touchy and sensitive thing. And there will be legal problems. For example, if you as a researcher learn that somebody is planning to have an abortion, you might be legally liable to tell the police so they can get arrested and, and you know, find um, or thrown, thrown into jail. Um, and the same extends to the data and the collection that we have. So for example, some technical platforms try to actively prevent people from collecting data. This is in part because they want to deter criminals and secret services and so on. Um, but it also uh, deters social scientists and encumbers our research. Just take Instagram, for example, which doesn't have any proper way of collecting data in a systematic fashion. There's no programming interface that we could use. And if you try to co collect and capture a lot of Instagram uh, content from your computer at a university, your access will be blocked very quickly. So we try to document all of this in this contested um, realm. And on the archival side, of course, once we did this, um, we want to create some sort of durable and permanent representation of what we found out. Because what we find out now in this fluctual um, and, and highly contested so, so, social um, environment will be important and will be referred to back in the future. For example, um, the, the um, presidency of Donald Trump is something where a lot of material was created and definitely historians and political scientists and sociologists will want to go back and look at what happened back, back then. But these media that we are working with, for example, Twitter or Instagram or whatever, they are losing a lot of the data over time for uh, lots of different reasons. For example, there may be state interference forcing them to delete things. People may delete their accounts. Um, there may be moderating decisions uh, where moderators of the platform deem that something is inappropriate. There may be users reporting content and wanting it to be deleted. There may be copyright infringement claims and so on. So there's a lot of different influences that um, lead to a lot of this data being lost. A colleague of mine, uh, Marco Bachel, once did a, a snapshot of political comments on German Facebook, for example, and he found out that over a span of six months, about one third of the political comments were deleted. So that means when we capture data 
ex post, it's practically worthless. And going on to data sharing, of course, all, all of this data, all of this material is only worth um, anything if we are able to talk about it and to transparently work with it. And this again goes back to the problematic situation that all of this is contested. So um, when we want to scientifically and objectively work with this kind of data, it is only possible to create something uh, of value when we can um, lay it open on the table and actually look at it and talk about it. Um, it's not just of use when there's some archive that we can open in a hundred years. Now, I mentioned a couple of the restrictions that we are facing, um, and there are actually more. Um, so for example, we uh, already um, had a very brief uh, mention of the technical challenges. Um, I, I have an archive that is now comprising some 300 something terabytes of data. Um, it's not really trivial to work with that. I once did a, a web uh, crawl where we had to use a supercomputer to extract the information that cost maybe 5,000 uh, euros in electricity alone to process the data. So all of these are challenges, but they are not the key point. The key point is that um, there's a lot of uncertainty, as we mentioned before, in the legal domain. We have terms and conditions of the platforms. We have copyright. Um, we have criminal law. Um, and we have things like um, ambiguous legal threats where, for example, uh, libel law in the UK might be used to threaten researchers working on something. So a large part of the problems that we see in this um, area is not just that things are hard or impossible, but that there's a risk that is hard to assess. And so one of the things that I want to um, want to give in your hands and, and want to take you uh, want you to take away from this. In the past, we talked about archives roles a lot um, in, in terms of keeping data and sharing data and processing and documenting and enriching data. From my perspective as a social scientist, what I want you to do is to protect and defend data. And that is much more active. You know, what I need especially what um, early career scholars need, is an institution that can take some of the risk and take it away from me. One of the large reasons why a lot of people don't share data in my perspective is that it's really hard to commit to say, I'm putting this data set out there and I will defend it against legal threats, against reputational threats, people, claiming that my research was not good and uh, political parties attacking me and all of this, I will defend this for the next 10 years. Really few people are willing and able to make this commitment, especially if your contract goes for one year or three years. So I think one of the key dimensions here is the temporal dimension that archival institutions have a really long-term focus and potentially possess the stability and maybe hopefully the resources to defend this sort of data that we um, give into their hands. And um, of course, a part uh, of, of these challenges are so big, especially in the, um, in the legal domain where it's about uh, new laws being enacted that one single archive can solve this problem. And that's something where we will gladly work together uh, where social scientists and learned societies will collaborate gladly to write open letters, to talk to politicians and say, we need to have better conditions for all of this. But you need to remember that the attention span for most of us is really, really short. Um, and maybe to highlight a couple of the, the other things, um, copyright is a really thorny issue, especially because it, it has been instrumentalized in the past to make legal claims that are in truth, something that's not about copyright, but about silencing people. And we also, of course, need to uh, be aware that there may, may be um, uh, true legal threats to individuals. So coming to my last dimension, the antagonists, the question is, of course, who are the institutions or the actors being responsible for all of these problems? And that's really, really broad array. 
Um, and that's part of what makes it so difficult. So for example, when we collect data, one of my key personal issues that I have with it is that I feel the tech companies like Facebook and Google are no longer good faith collaborators. So for example, there was the case of Social Science One, you may have heard of it. This was a big, uh, very complex collaboration set up between Facebook and um, scientists, select groups of scientists, um, which were given access to data. And after a lot of work, a lot of waiting, a lot of patience, um, the researchers need, came to the realization that the data that Facebook provided was not um, correct. So there were errors in it. And the question is, were those intentional errors? And we have seen in the past that um, in many, many cases, companies and platforms have intentionally degraded access to data or withheld data that was important. So we need to question the fact whether these platforms are good faith um, actors or bad faith actors. And that's why antagonistic data collection suddenly becomes a, a problem. And copyright holders in a, in a similar vein, um, in, the, in the process of politicization of communication, what we see more and more is that copyright is being used as an instrument to silence and to, for example, silence um, journalists and to try and control the spread of information, which is of course a threat to science when somebody um, claims that you need to destroy data that you have been collecting. And the ultimate step of all of this threat escalation letter, of course, are totalitarian regimes that will try to remove information or censor information or vice versa, of course, spread information in society. Just to mention one of these problematic situations, um, in the past, we know that Russia today has been trying to operate in Germany and produce German language speaking video content. And there was a YouTube channel, for example, um, where a lot of material was um, spread and could be watched in Germany. And then two things happened. One was that the German media authorities um, refused to hand a license to Russia Today. And the other was that YouTube, in a parallel review, decided that Russia Today was a problematic content uh, producer and deleted all of this content. Now, this is a political debate. But the problem for me as a researcher is that there used to be a sort of television channel that people watched that created media um, exposure and stimuli and potentially influenced people politically. But I have no way of accessing this content now because it was deleted. So that is um, just one of these uh, examples. Um, when we go to the question of data, data archival, we need to realize, of course, all of these technical things, there's also multiple dimensions. One is, again, who is willing and able to give a lot of money for me, uh, to me for archiving this, this sort of data? Um, for example, when I have multiple hundred terabytes of data that costs real money, it's a five-figure or six-figure money um, amount to, to store the data and to keep it accessible. Um, but also when we're talking about technical standards and the evolution of all of these things, um, I see a lot of problem problematic de developments where copyright control makes it hard to actually gather and store information. For example, television is going to be encrypted. It's already encrypted in many ways. Web television is encrypted in a way that we cannot um, circumvent in an, in an easy way. Uh, so we need to trust that whatever television archives um, are out there um, at the stations are truthful and are not uh, somehow you know, removed. And also there's no way to, to access a lot of material because a single hour of recordings costs 150 euros if I ask them. And finally, the sharing is of course one of the biggest problems where we have all of these privacy issues and we have leg legislators uh, trying to please everybody at, at the same time. We have universities trying to reduce their legal exposure, which is understandable, but problematic. So that is maybe the most complex one. All right, I think I'm out of time, but I tried to give you a very short tour de force uh, across all of the concrete pragmatic issues that I'm encountering 
And all of these things, every single one of them may be a deterrent to um, researchers for creating and sharing data. Um, all together of them are certainly a Gordian knot. Um, and one of the big questions is how we can solve it, if ever. Um, and to leave on a positive note, I see at least two positive developments. One is that um, there is on a European level increasing um, awareness and visibility of these issues. And for some politicians, there's a willingness to give special rights and special privileges to science and to archives for working with and, and protecting and collection, collecting these kind of data. And the second one is, I think that, um, I don't wanna say guerrilla, but you know, very brave um, single individual projects that go out there and show that there is a problem. For example, such as the documentation done by ProPublica, a, a nonprofit American journalism uh, group. These single really outstanding projects can show what's possible, can spotlight a problem and create a wider discussion in society. Thanks for listening. Um, and I'm happy, um, looking forward to all the questions. Okay, thanks so much. It was a really interesting talk. It was just one slide, but it was really packed with <laughs> excellent um, points um, that we can uh, try to unpack a bit now and in the discussion. Um, why don't we why don't we go right to it then? In the remaining time, we have about twenty minutes. Uh, I would like to start maybe with the first question that's in the chat for Pascal. Um, so. You can all probably open it and see it, but I will read it to you just in case. Uh -oh. So, Pascal, what do you think about rising blockchain technology, storing big data in the hands of few technologists? Are they good, bad, good faith, bad faith? In which sense? This is from, again, from Rostislav. All right, I need to tone down my reply because I have very strong opinions about blockchain. So blockchain is a brilliant technical solution to a problem that is almost never existent. Blockchains can ensure that there is a cryptographic signature for data that is, that is being written continuously. It, it is basically a database with a cryptographic proof that it's authentic. And that's a good idea. It is not a good idea to store, store a lot of data. Um, the blockchain needs a humongous amount of data storage to store data. So um, you will need um, hundreds and, and thousands of times the storage that you have in terms of material. So it's not efficient. And the second problem is the blockchain is proposed as a solution where you cannot trust people. But the problem is that in blockchains, to, for that to be able to work, to be able to uh, create authenticity and verifiability when you cannot trust anybody. It only works when there's no majority being able to compromise or to hijack the blockchain. That's, that's the key problems. And the, the question is, in science or in, so, in society, do we have a situation where there's a egalitarian group of people that we cannot trust um, but we can ensure that there will never be a majority having control over the, uh, over the largest part of this. Well, I don't think so, because when you have, for example, a contract between universities to guarantee the rules for a blockchain, you don't even need the blockchain in the first place, you just can have the contract. The contract already solves the problem that the blockchain um, is suggesting. So in, in my eyes, we need something similar to a blockchain, but not as a blockchain. What we need is we need something like vouching for data. So for example, if I were to produ produce data, some data set on, on tracking or on news pages or whatever, um, I would love the idea that I have a personal cryptographic signature that, can, that I can attach and I can vouch for it and say, I produced this data set at this point in time um, it's authentic. And then I can hand that to Gesis, for example, and they can give, hand it out to other people and everybody can verify that the data set that they get um, was from me originally. I think that is a good idea and we 
can begin to start, start thinking in this direction. But blockchain as a buzzword and as a technology, I think um, is, is too politicized to be the right um, concept here. Okay, thanks for that response. Um, I do want to come back to Thomas's um, earlier comment. Um, so I will just read it to you. Maybe, I don't know if Pascal, you will have um, um, a thought on this or perhaps um, someone else from our panel or from the other participants here, but I'll read it. Partly, I think some new data types are served from other repositories, sources, and or compiled from various sources when they are a combination of new and old data types. Often a challenge to decide if a data product like this can, for example, for from these legal reasons be archived for reuse. Okay, so that I think is one, one point, and I think it's um, uh, clearly a, a barrier to sharing this sort of um, combined sources in, in a data set. And then, I, but I take as a second point is also regarding NDTs, what about simulation data? These would not be matrices, but rather test models, code, and applications. I don't know if anybody from the panel or from um, the audience wants to respond to those two points, um, either Pascal or anyone else. I'm not sure what to say myself about the simulation data. Oh, Pascal, please. Yeah, I can I can um, say something about the simulation. Um, I think actually simulation data is a very grateful case for archival because it's um, not encumbered by copyright typically. It's not sensitive information. There's no private data in it. So that is a very good case. Um, and in many situations, we can already prepare code in a way um, that it is replicable. So the key challenge, at least to me, is first, of course, we have some sort of data format, but you can just put it in a zip file or put it on GitHub or whatever. But the bigger problem is that um, we have seen that over time, software evolves. And a big problem in computer science is that it may be impossible to reproduce the simulation results um, when you have more modern software or a different computer. Um, so what these, what a lot of people are working on, in fact, is to try and preserve not just the model, but the entire technology stack that we have that was necessary to create these conditions. And, and that means, um, for example, documenting precisely the versions of software that you used. I think there's uh, a couple of um, journals, for example, the um, Social Science Computer Review, they already require in peer review that you list the versions of software that were used. Um, and the bigger theme is, of course, um, transparency, openness, and uh, reproducibility and replicability in data, which is a very important and very desirable thing. So we want our data not just to be um, available to other people, but also that they can try and figure out um, whether what we did was, was correct. Um, and just to add to the second question um, about the linkage, that is in fact a huge problem in many, many ways, um, combining data. One is, um, as, you, as, as Thomas said, um, combining data from different legal uh, backgrounds. For example, I have tracking data from a commercial company that I cannot share, um, and I combine it with media data, media content data that I collected. Um, but I cannot share the resulting uh, raw data. Um, but another problem is, of course, that um, the more detail, the more information all of these data sets have, the easier it becomes to link data directly or indirectly via proxy variables and so on. So we will be um, thinking about identity reconciliation and de-anonymization a lot. There were a lot of cases, for example, the um, Netflix challenged the famous one where publicly available data sets were used in combination with other data sets to identify individual people and point them out. Um, and that is a problem 
again, this is a problem of the time frame because what you want to guarantee is that never in the future will it be possible to identify these people. But I'm no, not sure if that's even, you know, mathematically and logically possible to claim that there, there will never be any way to de-anonymize people. Good, thanks. Thanks for your response. And I do want to say, um, Fasco, I thought that your your presentation went very well with Yevans um, because his was sort of a broader view from a researcher perspective and yours was really very concrete from a particular practitioner point of view. And I think those two um, complemented each other very nicely. Um, let's, let's look now at Demetra's comment in the chat and question, which I think is really interesting and opens up some interesting um, possibilities. Um, this is a question to Pascal. Um, so in your uh, great speech, thank you, you referred to institutions able to defend the data um, to take on some of the risk. I, I would add, I think that's what you said. Um, do you propose a new archival organization that goes beyond technical boundaries and defend the intellectual work that has been made via the data? So what I would like to, to have, what I would like to exist is, for example, one of the institutions that exist is the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive is a tremendous resource of historical data. Um, and they are very brave because they expose themselves to a lot of issues and threats and legal, legal um, disputes, ongoing legal disputes, to safeguard important human knowledge and human um, you know, data about social uh, processes, about politics, about history. And I would like something like this um, to be, um, uh, yeah, extended to, the, to Europe. Um, there's, for example, one other great example. I'll post the link in the chat. There's a wonderful project that is actually sort of a collaboration with the Internet Archive, which is called PERMA. And that's a project from, I think, Harvard. Um, they, and they enable researchers and legal scholars and, and journals and so on to create individual um, verifiable snapshots of web pages. So something like this for social media would be absolutely a godsend. But let me add a second scenario. What happens if we cannot do this? Well, if, if there's no momentum and no resources for one central institution, then we need to think about how we can enable a distributed, loose or tightly knit network of archives, of individuals, of researchers, of institutions that work together either formally or informally or on a technical basis through technological um, uh, APIs to create some, some sort of collaborative um, archive. So for example, I would be very happy if we just had a software where I can put in my data sets that I have and the software would create metadata and share it with other people and other researchers and other archival institutions. And it would be possible to compare and analyze the metadata and figure out who has what and then use that as a basis to bring together people. Maybe that would be a first step. And of course, the protection, you know, offering um, to take on legal, um, legal disputes and uh, create precedents and, and uh, do pro bono counsel counseling and so on, all of that would be very, very um, great as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have a little bit more time and I'm thinking about how we can make the most of it. Um, and so maybe if we can sort of zoom out, um, think about sort of the general purposes um, of the workshop, what we wanted to accomplish in bringing together people from the archives, uh, researchers and, and uh, others from uh, other perspectives. Um, and to, uh, to think now, address this question maybe together, you know, well, what do we need to do, um, especially from an archival perspective, to prepare for 
new data types so that these can be handled um, and shared and reused and exploited and, and so on. Um, but I don't want to guide the discussion too much. Um, what I would like to do rather is to, is to open this now to um, different voices here from people who want to say something regarding uh, the particular presentations or the general issues around new data types. Um, this would be the moment. So don't, um, don't hesitate to, um, to raise your hand virtually or to add a comment into the chat. This is, this is the chance. I'll give it a couple seconds before we stimulate the discussion with a question or two. Okay, I don't see any hands going up. Don't see no comments or questions. <laughs> okay. Well, let me um, let me then try to inject uh, something into the discussion and and see if it will come up with some some reaction. Um, here's a general question I thought of during the workshop, um, especially addressed to colleagues who are within um, data archives. Um, my question is, you know, given the circumstances, given what we know now about the barriers to sharing uh, from the researcher side, from the archival side, my question is, do you think it's really worth it now to invest to prepare for a future deluge, um, given that it might not come right away. And we have other, other priorities and resource constraints within our institutions. How important is it to prepare for something which might not come right away? I hope it was a meaningful question. <laughs> um, anybody want to try to answer that? Is it worth it to invest, to build our capacity now for something which might never materialize? Was it too abstract of a question? Too hypothetical? Pascal. Yeah, um, I'll be happy to concede um, the, the microphone to anybody else, but um, just to jump in here, I was thinking about whether it would make sense, for example, to archive the front page of, of YouTube and all of its videos on every single day, just as an example. And that would be quite a deluge of data, as you mentioned. Um, and I believe my, my gut reaction was most of it would be completely worthless. So in 10 years, would it be very interesting to look at videos of people repairing their cars or you know, figuring out how you can flip a bottle in the best way? And then you, we have 5,000 of these videos, probably irrelevant, right? On the other hand, there's a lot of researchers and people who are interested in these kind of things and they just don't know that the data exists. So I think it would be definitely a good idea to bring together people who are interested and archives to have hackathons or ha have workshops where you come together and hands on, you try out what you have and what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of that going on. For example, the Deutsche Nationalbibliothek has been doing some of these things. They have prices, they have programs where you can apply to use some of their data sets. Um, and I think that's actually a good way to stimulate creativity and also to bring in some awareness from outside what the data that you have or that you may um, create and collect um, might, may bring to people. That's an excellent um, suggestion to do hackathons together, um, maybe with archives in collaboration with, with practitioners and researchers. Um, so that we can develop kind of our skills in a way to to also test, you know, the utility of of some of these things, um, and and have a good time at the same time. Um, here's um, a comment from Demetra. Um, she answers, uh, "I think it is." So I I guess I think that means I think it's worth the investment. 
um, though taking into consideration the boundaries and obstacles depicted by research communities and the societal challenges. Okay, so that's a positive. Um, even if Pascal's speech raised other issues as well to reflect on. Okay, thanks for the link, Pascal. Um, so we have officially arrived <laughs> at the the end time that we had foreseen for uh, for the workshop. And so um, what I would like to do is is to thank everyone for um, taking the time, investing the time uh, to come and participate in this workshop, um, especially um, those who who presented. So um, Pascal and Martin and Yevon, thanks very much for your really good presentations. Um, I hope that this would not be the end of our um, discussions about new data types um, and how archives um, within SESTA and outside um, should be dealing with this. I hope it's really just the beginning. And so um, it could be that we get in touch with all of those who registered. We'll send you the link to the workshop recording and the slides and so on. Um, but maybe we'll also think about inviting you to future um, events or discussions and so on so we can so we can keep this uh, keep this going. I think uh, I still expect that there'll be a, a deluge at some point um, that uh, new types of research and data are going to be happening and arriving um, at our doorsteps. Um, and so we, I do believe we need to be ready for it. So um, in that case, um, if there's no one else who wants to add um, a comment, uh, say something, I think we just end it there. So thanks everybody, nice to have you and um, have a good, have a good end of day.